Well, I'd like to wish everyone a happy Sabbath today. And you can see by the, um, the screen, this topic today that we're going to talk about is the forgiveness of God. And in order to um, enter into the into this topic, I'd just like to read an amazing facts I uh, had found a little while back. And it's uh, this amazing fact says the most bitter tasting substance known is the synthetic chemical uh, denatonium, sometimes known as bitrix. It's added to toxic substances such as antifreeze and household cleaners, paints, nail polish, and rat poison to prevent accidental swallowing. It is so bitter, they say, that even when diluted to 10 parts per million, most people will instantly spit it out. Now, there was also a, a psychiatrist who had treated um, many, you know, many patients. And, you know, he is, you know, one of the things that he had said um, is that uh, if he could convince his patients in, psychi in the psychiatric hospitals that um, he worked in, if he could convince his patients that their sins were forgiven, 75% of them would walk out of that hospital that very day. And so, you know, when we think about it, you know, when we talk about the subject of forgiveness, um, you know, we think about um, what it has done to us. And it's pretty amazing is that, you know, most of the psychiatric problems that he saw was a result of guilt, the guilt that they have. And if they, he could convince them that they were forgiven, that many of their symptoms would just go away. Now, with that, I would like to... Um, Let's take a look at what is a what is a definition of forgiveness. Well, forgiveness, you know, one of the definitions is compassionate feelings that support a willingness to forgive. Another one is to act is the act of excusing a mistake or a or an offense. Now, there are two types of forgiveness that, um, that we have to, um, to deal with here. One is the forgiveness of man. It's the forgiveness that most of us are familiar with because, you know, none of us have done anything uh, or have led a perfect life. And all of us have had to uh, seek forgiveness or to give forgiveness to someone who has transgressed upon us. And so we call that the forgiveness of man, the forgiveness that we give to one another when uh, someone has wronged us. Or if we have wronged someone, we seek the, their forgiveness as well. Now, the other kind of forgiveness is, and is the one that we're going to talk about today, is the forgiveness of God. Now, there are some health benefits to um, uh, forgiveness. One, it can lower your blood pressure. You know, I don't think many people uh, realize is that when they're harboring unforgiveness in their heart, um, it has an effect upon their body. And so their blood pressure goes up. And so if, if we could just forgive one another the, the things that they have done against us, it can lower our blood pressure. It can lower our stress levels. It'll lower our heart rate. It'll have, uh, there'll be a reduction of chronic pain. You know, so if any of you are having pain in your, you know, in your lives, uh, chronic pain, you know, maybe uh, there's some forgiveness that you need to, to give to, to someone. And it says, and, and they say is that uh, one of the health benefits of uh, forgiveness is it'll give you an extension of life. And it just makes sense is that if it lowers your blood pressure, lowers your stress, lowers your heart rate and reduces your chronic pain, you're going to live a longer and healthier life. So interestingly, um, the forgiveness of man many times, you know, when we think about it, is conditional upon circumstances. We, we tend to extend forgiveness when someone apologizes for what they've done, but many times this forgiveness is not true forgiveness. You know, and I know many times we have seen it, you know, either in our lives or in the lives of others. We tend to continue to hold the offense that they had done against us, um, the person, even after we have claimed that we have forgiven them. For example, so a husband does something that hurts his wife and then later apologizes to, you know, apologizes to her about it. And so she forgives him, but continues to remind him of it from time to time whenever it suits her. Um, 
that, you know, this usually happens because the memory and the pain that was caused by the offense, you know, that has happened remains. And so the pain, you know, of that offense or whatever the person had done, husband, wife, you know, father, daughter, you know, son, you know, all of these things, co-workers, you know, it, it has uh, an effect upon us and the memory of that remains. As a fellow human beings, we tend to hold on to feelings of resentment long after the offense. In cases where we are hurt or offended by uh, the actions or inactions of others, we tend to hold on to the resentment for a long time. And this has a, an effect upon our bodies. When we hold on to these feelings of resentment, it becomes like a poison in our lives. It affects our relationship with others, with our friends, with our coworkers, with our family members. It affects our health. You saw the, the, the benefits of, um, of forgiveness. And so it has an effect upon our health. It has an effect upon our overall quality of life. So medical researchers have uh, become interested and studying the effects of forgiveness and healing process, the evidence is mounting that it does lower blood pressure, it does lower stress levels, it does lower the heart rate, and all of these wonderful things. And, um, you know, and it's all just coming from forgiveness. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24, um, this is King Solomon, you know, before he had uh, was led into sin. He said, pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Beautiful words that, you know, that the wisest man that ever lived on this earth other than Jesus Christ had said. And uh, again, in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22, it says, a merry heart doth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. And so when we think about, you know, harboring resentment, you know, against others that have wronged us, um, we don't realize that it really is, is doing some terrible things to us. And so the forgiveness of man is always conditional. One, it's conditional uh, upon um, the person asking for forgiveness. And it's also conditional upon whether or not, you know, how deep was the hurt. Sometimes uh, when someone asks for forgiveness, they don't want to give that forgiveness. And they continue to whole harbor that resentment. When, is, when, when um, the, uh, the Bible tells us that it's better to let it go before, you know, other, otherwise it'll dry the bones. So the forgiveness of God, in contrast to the forgiveness of man, is not the same. We find in Matthew chapter 18, uh, verses 21 through 34, we find that God's forgiveness is complete. So why don't we turn in our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 18. And in, in Matthew chapter 18, it goes through the steps that we need to do in order to, um, you know, to, you know, to, you know, talking about forgiveness. So in Matthew chapter 18, verse, starting verse 21, it says, and the, the title of this part. And Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he began to reckon one, he was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand tal talents. Now, um, just you know, to, to give you an idea of what ten thousand talents was, back in that time, it was basically a sum so great that there was absolutely no way for him to pay it back. Even if he, he worked the rest of his life and his family worked the rest of their life, there's no way that they could pay that great fortune. And so it had been found that this servant of the king had been embezzling all these funds for a period of time, and he was not able to pay, pay it back. But in verse 25, it says, but for as much as he has not to pay his Lord, commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. And so the king was going to exact from him as much as he could to pay that debt. 
The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him, forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down in, in, at his feet and besought him, saying, Have pit, patience with me, and I, I will pay thee all. And in verse 30, and it says, And he went and he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told him unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desired of me. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due upon him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you, if ye for your hearts forgive not every one of his brother that trespasses. And so the we have this story, you know, of this servant that was forgiven a great sum. And how did he show his appreciation to his Lord. He went to someone that owed him money, a very, very small amount of money. And because he could not pay him, he did not show the same mercy upon him and threw him in to until he could pay it. And so Jesus was, was saying, hey, you know, I have forgiven, you know, our, your father in heaven have forgiven you everything, such a great debt that you could not even pay. And he's saying, if you will not forgive the little things that, that your brothers uh, and fellow man does to you, how is it that the Lord is going to continue to forgive you? And so God's forgiveness is complete. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My friends, forgiveness comes when we recognize that we are sinners and we confess this before the Lord. We need to understand that the forgiveness of God does not end with the forgiving of our sins. If you notice in 1 John 1, 9, the very first part says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The forgiveness of God continues until we are cleansed from all unrighteousness. It goes to the very heart of our problem is our sinful heart. Now, I know we've talked about this in different forms before, but Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27 says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do, do them. My friends, the forgiveness of God transforms the life. Now, the, the forgiveness of man has no ability to transform us. It has no ability to take away the sting of the, uh, the transgression that was done against uh, us. But the forgiveness of God has the power to transform our heart. So when we are forgiven... Um, we find in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God commendeth his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What it means is, is that while we were yet sinners, God forgave us. Even before we asked to be forgiven, even before we had come to recognize that we were sinners, God provided Christ, his son, for the forgiveness of our sins, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ made the sacrifice so that we could be forgiven. Our forgiveness with God happened long before we were born. In fact, it happened before any on earth had come to become sinners. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8 tells us, says, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names were, are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so what it's saying here is that 
is that God has forgiven us of our sins. He had provided forgiveness from us, for us, before the very foundation of the world. Our forgiveness was pre present in God before we had sinned. Now, you notice I said the forgiveness of God was in his heart, was already a part of him before we were even brought into our existence. The heart of God is love towards us. In fact, the plan of salvation was in the mind of God from eternity past. His forgiveness of our sins was in his heart long before our sins, long before the things that we had done. The forgiveness that God gives to us is an expression of his great love for us. You know, many times we, we think, you know, I'm just a lowly person. There's nothing really good about me. God, you know, how can God even love me? And we look back at our lives and all the terrible things that we had done. But when we read the Bible, it says, while we were yet sinners, he forgave us. He loved us. He provided a way of salvation for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says this, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And so he doesn't, he doesn't impute, he doesn't charge before us the sins that we have committed. He has uh, committed unto us a spirit of reconciliation. Our forgiveness of sin, my friends, is complete. It covers all the sins that we have committed and, it com and, and all of the sins that we will commit until Christ continue or completes the work of sanctifying us and preparing us for heaven. This was all provided to us from the very foundation of the world, from before he even created the earth. So when we accept that we are sinners, when we accept Christ as our Savior, our sins are forgiven us. For many today, this experience of forgiveness is like a roller coaster ride. And I know that every one of you understands what I'm talking about here. When we commit sin, we come to the Lord and we ask for forgiveness. We, we recognize that we did something terrible and we throw ourselves down and we ask the Lord for forgiveness. And as we are forgiven, we stand up and we strive to stop sinning. But like we all know, we, we, we fall back into it from time to time. And then we go down onto our knees again, and we ask for the forgiveness of the Lord. So when we're forgiven of God, we feel good, and we're riding high. And then when we make another mistake, we're down in the depths. It's almost like when we ask for forgiveness, we're saved. And when we sin again, we're lost, saved and lost, saved and lost. A roller coaster ride that just makes all of us sick. But my friends, that's not, that's not how God sees it. If, if, um, if so, I am happy to tell you, let me just read this here. And this thing goes on and on until we stop sinning. And it's in, is this how our experience is with God? Do we have this experience, this relationship with God that when we are good, we feel close to God. And then we, when we're, when we're not good when we make mistakes that we're far away from God and back and forth, is that our experience with God? Well, I'm, tell, I'm happy to tell you here today is this, is that that does not have to be the relationship that we have with God. Yes, God knows that we will make mistakes. He knows that on the way to sanctification, there's going to be rough patches that he has to work through us. But he has already provided us the, the, the forgiveness for the sin. He's already provided us the remedy for that. His forgiveness goes to the very heart of our problem, and that is our sinful nature. His cleansing from all unrighteousness goes to the very heart of what we need, is we need a new heart. So the work that Christ, that Jesus has done at the cross has forever, notice this, the work that he did at the cross has forever removed sin as an obstacle in our relationship with him. Now, I want you to notice something here. You know, when we do something wrong to our spouses, 
to our children, to our coworkers or friends or something like that. We tend to avoid them because we don't want to, you know, because the memory of what we had done, you know, plagues us and it affects our relationship with one another. But with God, this is not the case. He knows that we are going to sin, but he has provided a remedy for it. The new covenant is not based upon keeping the law of God. So the old covenant back in the Old Testament was based upon keeping the law of God, but the new covenant is not based upon keeping the law of God. It's about receiving the righteousness of God in his son. In the Old Covenant, there was a remembrance of sin. Now, I, this is very interesting here. Listen to this. Is that in the Old Covenant, there was a remembrance of sin. Daily, there was a confession of sin, and sin was recorded. And symbolically, that sin went into the heavenly sanctuary, and where it was recorded and remembered. At the end of the year, on the Day of Atonement, the sins were blotted out by the blood of Jesus, which represents his life. The blood, yeah, the blood represents his life. It was the life of Jesus that cleansed the sinner from their sins. So as we have received Jesus, as we have received the life of Jesus, our sins have been blotted out. They are no longer an issue with God. I know that in Isaiah it says, thy sins have separated thee from God. But now because we have the very life of God living within us, our sins are no longer separating from us because they are blotted out. Notice this. I want you to, to notice this in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. And this is a, a, it's a text that tells us that sin is no longer a problem for us. It's not something that God is holding against us. Notice this. It says in Hebrews 10, verse 16, it says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after these days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts, and into their minds will I write them. But notice this, verse 17 tells us something about our sins. It says, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Because of Christ, our problem is not with sin, it is with our belief. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our true problem is that we do not believe in the forgiveness that God has given us. Now, I'd like to, you know, there's a story of Joseph's um, forgiveness of his brothers. Now, if you, if you remember the story of Joseph, um, who was um, sent to, you know, his brothers had, instead of killing him, they had sent him as a, sold him as a slave to, to Egypt. And so in the story, you know, um, of the wrong that his brothers had done him, sold him into slavery, which was worse in their, you know, in their minds than, than death, that he would be going into a pagan land and be the servant, you know, of those, um, you know, of the Egyptians. But as you know, you know, Joseph tested his brothers to see if they had changed. And when he had tested them and he had saw that they had truly repented of their sins, he forgave them of their sins. Now, um, he forgave them, but they did not truly believe that they had been forgiven. They feared that he would avenge the wrong that they had done against him. They carried this guilt and fear all the while their father Jacob was alive. And so you remember that Joseph sent for his, his father and his brother Benjamin, and he brought them into the land of Goshen. And that is where all of their families had lived. But And all of the time while their father uh, Jacob was alive, Israel is what God changed his name to. While he was alive, they still didn't believe that Joseph had forgiven him. And they were thinking that, well, when their father dies, he will then exact his revenge upon them. They carried this guilt and feel, fear all the while their father was alive. And when he died, they thought that Joseph would finally avenge himself. Now let's turn to the book of Genesis, because it's, this is a, a moving thing. Now, the thing that we're trying to, um, to bring out here is that we sometimes, we don't believe in the forgiveness that God has given us. So turn to the book of Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50, 
And we're going to read about five or six verses here in Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. This is what it says in Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. It says, and when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will pre-adventure hate us and will certainly uh, uh, requisite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And so, they, they, they sent a messenger to Joseph, reminding him that the father said to forgive them, and then not to hold the things that they had done against them. And when Joseph heard that, he was, he was, he was saddened. He, he began to cry because they thought that he had harbored ill will against them. And in verse 18, it says, and his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. And so the brothers, all this time that their father was alive, they harbored this feeling of fear, thinking that Joseph would exact his revenge upon them because they did not believe in the the forgiveness that he gave to them. Joseph had forgiven them long ago, but they would not believe. My friends, the same is true today for us as well. God has forgiven us long ago, yet we do not believe in the forgiveness that God has given. The unbelief causes a problem in our relationship with God. This problem is not with God, but with our own unbelief, and it causes us to not want to be in the presence of God. Just like Adam, when he had sinned, he was afraid to go into the presence of God. But we have received this forgiveness of our sins. And then we seem to be uh, hesitant to be brought into the presence of God. But what does, what does um, John say? It says, come boldly, or this is Paul, come boldly to the throne of grace. So our response to the forgiveness of God is this. The forgiveness that God has, past tense, given to us is so great that it covers every sin that we have committed and every sin that we will commit. This is the love that God has towards us. Now, with this in mind, how should we, as followers of Christ, be towards others? Matthew chapter 5, verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So what does it mean to be merciful? It means to forgive others as we have been forgiven. It means that even before someone asks for our forgiveness, we must forgive them in our hearts. That's a tall order for a lot of us, to forgive someone even though they haven't asked for this forgiveness. How can we do that? It's just not part of our human nature. The answer is that is it's not in ourselves. We cannot do this. But if Christ is truly living within our hearts, we can. We can give this forgiveness. But if Christ is truly living within us, we will forgive. Notice what it says here in Matthew chapter 16, verses, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. It says, for if ye forgive men their trespass, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespass, neither will your Father forgive your trespass. And so really what this is saying is that if we harbor unforgiveness in our hearts, 
it means that Christ is not living within us. We do not have the forgiveness of God in us because if we have the forgiveness of God living within us, the natural outflow will be forgiveness for others. We will not harbor resentment against them. So I'd like to close with, um, with a story. A story I think I've either read or heard in another sermon. But it's, um, there's a legend has it that when the time came for Leonardo, talking about Leonardo da Vinci, to paint the face of Judas in the Last Supper, he got the sinister idea of using the face of his rival Michelangelo to be the face of the betrayer. He felt it was a great way to immortalize how he felt about his enemy. And people came by, you know, people came by as he worked and gasped when they recognized the face of Michelangelo as Judas. Leonardo felt some temporary vindication. But when it came the last step in his grand artwork, painting the very face of Jesus, as he tried to capture the image of Christ, he would paint his countenance but he would feel dissatisfied and he'd wipe it away. For the next few weeks, he did this over and over again, trying to paint the countenance of Jesus, trying to, to put in there the very face of one that us love and forgiveness. He did it over and over again. He had Jesus' body complete, but he couldn't create the right face that magnificent countenance of mercy and kindness. In desperation, Leonardo uh, prayed that he could paint the face that would express the love and compassion of Christ. Lord, help me to see your face, he pleaded with God. Now, as the story goes, finally a voice spoke to his heart saying, you will never see the face of Jesus until you change the face of Judas. Leonardo convict, was convicted. He thought about Jesus on the cross, paying for the forgiveness of those who crucified him, or praying for the forgiveness of those who crucified him, and about how offended he himself had been by petty insults. He erased Michelangelo's face and painted the image we see there today. Only when Leonardo let the bitterness towards Michelangelo and remove the offense could he clearly paint the image of Christ. You know, many of us, we can't see the face of Christ, the face of Jesus, because we're harboring resentment against others. We're harboring unforgiveness in our hearts towards our enemies. We are determined to pay people back that all we can see is what they have done wrong to us. We are ungrateful servants, demanding our debtors pay us in full, yet our vengeful hearts keep us from seeing fully the face of Christ and receiving his forgiveness. You know, my brothers and sisters, forgiveness is not something that is natural to the heart, but to the human heart. It is something that can only come if Christ is living within you. As Christ is living within your heart, forgiveness will come freely, will come naturally. The sins that we have committed will no longer want to do. My friends, if you're harboring, if you're having trouble seeing the face of Jesus, forgive those around you. Because if we don't forgive those around us, then the love of God is not living within us. And that's really the remedy for sin. The remedy for the sin in our hearts is the love of God living within us. So my brothers and sisters, you know, I love every one of you, you know, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And that love doesn't come from me as a human being. It comes from God. 
I often tell myself, there's nothing good in me except Christ living within me. It's the only good thing in any of us is Jesus Christ. The problems that we have in, in the world today all stem from the love of God not being in the hearts of, of those in the world. If we would invite Christ into our hearts and share that love with those whom we come into contact with, we are shining the light of love, the brightness of God, you know, to all those whom we come into contact with. We become a beacon of light to a dark and dying world. That's really, that's all the gospel is. It's just sharing the love of God with others. That's it. If we don't see the face of Christ, it's because we're not forgiving others. And when we forgive others, we will see the face of God. So my brothers and sisters, that's our message today. I pray that you were blessed because I know I was blessed. Blessed that you're here. I'm blessed that God is living within my heart and he's working to cleanse me from all unrighteousness in the same way that he is working to cleanse you all from unrighteousness so that we can be reunited with God once again, that where he is, we may be also. So praise God, and uh, I pray that you all um, are going to sing our, um, our closing hymn. Let me share my screen. We'll sing together, and we'll fellowship a little bit afterwards. The song that we're going to sing is Jesus Paid It All.
before the throne. I stand in Him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, what a, what a wonderful blessing you have given to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the forgiveness of sin that you have given to each and every one of us, that the forgiveness that you have had in your heart from the very, very beginning, before the foundation of, the, of this world, and that you provide this forgiveness, not just the a forgiveness of what we have done, but a cleansing from all unrighteousness, a cleansing that washes away our sins and makes us a new person. Thank you for being with us here today, Lord. Thank you for comforting us. Thank you for all that you do. Father, there is nothing good in any of us except Jesus Christ living within our hearts. That's the only good thing. And when Jesus, your son, is living within us, you are living within us. And forgiveness will flow from our hearts. We invite you afresh into our hearts again. We invite you that, the love, that your love may flow through us to others. That this gospel can be preached to everyone. And then the end will come. I ask this all in the blessed, powerful, and the very wonderful name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.